Okay. So, so <clears throat> thank you, Tom. And uh, I would thank James for that great introduction, but he had to run out to go treat some people with the gamma knife. Um, and, uh, and just to, to touch a little bit on Len's question uh, from the last time, there's always, there's, always an, there's always an element of choice, right? There's, you know, there's a substantial number of patients that we treat that are not surgical candidates. There's a large number of patients that we never see because they're great surgical candidates. But the efficacy of this technology becomes very important for those patients who are high-risk candidates. And so, you know, we've spent a lot of time trying to identify subgroups where radiosurgery does not work, for example. And hopefully the surgeons are identifying subgroups where surgery is higher risk. But it, it, that always is going to come into play. So um, as an academic, as you all know, the only thing better than recycling your own presentation is recycling other people's presentations. <laughs> so, so when uh, uh, Renee extended the invitation to speak today, and it was, um, I think, a week after or a week before our ASTRO meeting, I thought it was a great opportunity to take some of our presentations from ASTRO, which kind of represents the work that we're doing um, you know, within the realm of, um, of lung SBRT in, in our department. And James obviously covered the outcomes part, so that left me with kind of the clinical translational aspects. So James did a great introduction. The difference between radiosurgery and fractionated radiation really is that radiosurgery is a much higher biologically effective dose, BED, uh, and is delivered with much higher precision, so therefore hopefully more effective and at the same time less toxic because we're treating less of the surrounding normal tissue. This is actually the first, um, I don't know how to use the, is this one? So this is actually uh, the first report of SBRT used in lung tumors from 1995. So that defines ancient history uh, in radiation oncology. So in North America, the clinical work really started at the University of Indiana with Rob Timmerman. Uh, he conducted phase one dose escalation and, and then a subsequently a phase two trial. Uh, some important information came out of the the phase two trial, and James alluded to this a little bit earlier. So this was 70 patients, T1, T2, um, non-small cell lung ca uh, cancer. They were medically inoperable, so these were patients who were deemed unfit for surgery. Um, they were treated with uh, SBRT. Uh, they received very high dose, 60 gray or 54 gray in three fractions. And uh, the local control of close to 90% was just markedly better than anything we'd seen before in fractionated radiation. More interestingly, the, pa the pattern of failure was much different also than what we're seeing. There are very few local failures and more of a, a failure pattern that you see with surgery, a lot of nodal and a lot of distant failures. There were significant grade three to five toxicities. Okay, so part of the reason this number is, two, is, is relatively high is something that Tom alluded to in his question. When this protocol was written, they announced that basically any pulmonary toxicity would be attributed to the, to the radiation treatment. So a lot of these patients actually entered the trial with a baseline grade three pulmonary toxicity. Um, and obviously if they got worse, it was counted as a grade four or, or a grade five. Um, but the interesting thing that, that the authors found was that the vast majority of the um, high toxicities occurred in patients with centrally located tumors. So those within what they call the zone of the proximal tracheobronchial tree, so within two centimeters of those structures. So if you exclude those patients and just treat peripheral tumors, the treatment was very well tolerated, 10% grade three or greater toxicity, where it was significantly higher, 27% in those central tumors. And this is important just to talk a little bit about the work that we presented this year. So that was the, the that favorable subset was what was identified to proceed with the large RTUG study, the 0236, which James mentioned. Again, uh, three-year overall survival, 56%, low bar, the low bar failure rate, was less than 10%, and again, a pattern of failure similar to you'd see from surgery, very low toxicity in these small tumors, very peripherally located. So this was our program. So our program started in 2007. Um, we, uh, I think, treated, started treating in the fall of that year. Um, in the first four years, we had really um, very, um, really incredible growth of the program. It's flattened out a little bit since 2011, primarily because we now also treat these patients at several of our ambulatory sites. And also since that time, many of the other um, unaffiliated programs in the state have started their own programs. So through about 2008, 2009, we were the only provider in the state for the service. Um, and now it's a little bit diff more difficult to compete for those patients. So we seem to be hovering around 70 primary lung cancers, cancers a year, 
just in this uh, just in the in the Smilo building, um, and as you can see, the oops in green, uh, a number of the metastatic patients. So, our, we we um, submitted and presented a number of uh, fantastic studies at our ASTRO uh, meeting this year, and this is really just the collection of our our pulmonary presentations. About half of these are outcomes-based research, and James uh, really has been the mentor to all of our, our residents and fellows um, uh, with that respect. I chose three of the clinical presentations that were presented in an oral session to kind of give you a sense of where we're going with our uh, research program. So first, I identified uh, that peripheral tumors are the ones uh, that have been identified as safe to treat. Obviously, we don't really have a choice of the patients that come to us, and we have, if we have a medically inoperable patient with a centrally located tumor, we'd like to offer them the safest and most effective therapy. The RTOG has conducted a trial on this, which they just completed accrual to, so in a year or so we will uh, start to see some results for that. We have been treating central tumors off protocol, and we've been using a, uh, a, a kind of dose adaptation where we've been using somewhat lower biologically effective dose, spreading the fractionation from three to five fractions. Um, and uh, so this was really just a retrospective review of our experience. Uh, so we selected uh, patients with primary lung cancers, uh, basically in, in the Smilo building that were within the zone of the uh, proximal tracheobronchial tree uh, or you know, immediately adjacent to other mediastinal structures. And this is a pretty well-established definition of central at this point. Uh, this is patients that have at least a year of follow-up, so we stopped selecting patients in August of 2013. We identified 111 central tumors and compared them to 150 peripheral tumors that were treated over the same time period. Um, interestingly, the central tumors tend to be somewhat larger, um, as you can see, and that's consistent um, among groups who report this kind of thing. We treated them to a lower biologically effective dose, so the peripheral tumors um, got the standard fractionation as developed by the RTOG0236. Our central tumors tend to get treated somewhat lower dose, and over time our treatment has evolved from lower BEDs up to somewhat higher BED, and we're sitting right around here this time. So you can see the central tumors tend to get a, little, a few more fractions and a little bit lower dose. So the question really was whether this was a safe and effective treatment. On univariate analysis, comparing the central and peripheral tumors. The overall survival was essentially no different between the two cohorts, despite the fact that the central tumors were somewhat larger and affected patients were somewhat older. Uh, local control, again, identical in both cohorts. So the biologically effective dose that we've chosen for our central tumors does seem to be sufficient, um, at least within the bounds of uh, this relatively small experience. The most important outcome here was toxicity. And, what we were expecting to see was that we were having higher toxicity in the central tumors, um, hopefully not as bad as, as was seen when they were treated to higher dose. We were expecting to see a somewhat higher rate. Um, surprisingly, it turns out that um, acute toxicity, which is mostly pulmonary, uh, was actually higher uh, in the peripheral tumor cohort than the central tumor cohort. And we hypothesize one reason is that we're treating more lung in these patients and less mediastinum. Um, late toxicity that occurring after 30 days, I'm oh, sorry, after 90 days was essentially no different um, and uh, quite acceptably low. So on multivariate analysis when controlling for the other uh, clinical pathologic factors and predictors of toxicity, um, this uh, uh, risk of acute toxicity being somewhat higher in the peripheral uh, cohort uh, actually held up and, and again the late toxicity there was no difference. Um, and we found that we were basically not seeing local failure, so we were not seeing an effect of the lower dose on those central tumors. So in conclusion, uh, we found that patients with these centrally located tumors treated with our dose-adapted scheme uh, appeared to have non-inferior uh, acute lane toxicity and non-inferior local control and survival. So we think this is a successful strategy. The RTOGO813 is the completed trial. We'll see the result of that in the next year or two. Um, this actually represents the largest experience in North America in central tumors um, and the second largest um, internationally. The, the group in the, at the VU in the Netherlands has about 140 patients. And, and Roy, you defined this earlier. What's the definition of a central tumor? 
So typically it's defined as either within two centimeters of the central airways, so the lobar bronchi or the bronchus intermedius or the trachea. By CAT scan. Yeah, by CT scan. So and this is different than surgeons defining central tumors, which is actually a little bit more nebulous. Okay, so, um, so this led us to second presentation, since we have a large experience in central tumors. One of the reasons that we have been so conservative with our dose fractionation scheme is fear of tracheoesophageal fistula or fear of uh, uh, esophageal stenosis. This is felt universally to be the dose limiting factor um, in lung tumors. And the reason why typically we will treat uh, even a, a hyalur mass, but not a mediastinal mass with stereotactic body radiotherapy. So there's a lot of interest as this technology diffuses into the community in figuring out what the uh, dose volume predictors of esophagitis are. So I apologize in advance. Um, the only people who are ever going to care about any of this are radiation oncologists. Um, but just to give you a taste of kind of the, the studies that we do. So um, again, esophageal toxicity is, we think, the dose limiting uh, uh, effect of, of centrally located uh, lung tumors getting ready surgery. The current dose constraints that we all use are basically made up. <clears throat> they are extrapolated from fractionated treatment. Um, and essentially, they were chosen out of a hat, and we've all been following them and getting away with it. So the purpose of this study was to review our own toxicity and to try to um, establish uh, some of those dose volume risks. So um, this work, most, most of this work was done by uh, a fantastic medical student named Eileen Harder, who actually contoured the esophagus on several hundred patients um, and carefully collected their dose volume data. We collected the dose uh, to points in the esophagus as well as dose to various volumes in 0.5 cc increments. Um, and uh, we then actually tried to fit this data to kind of establish what we call normal tissue complication probability modeling, which is a way of modeling uh, toxicity based on dose exposure um, in fractionated radiation, something that's never been validated in um, stereotactic, uh, with stereotactic doses. So we identified, again, 157 patients uh, that, that we could contour the esophagus on and had reasonable follow-up. Um, our overall rate of grade, three, grade two or greater toxicity was very low, nine patients out of 157. We had no grade four or grade five esophageal toxicity. Um, using uh, uh, multivariate logistic regression and uh, forward stepwise analysis, we identified that the dose to 1.5 cc was the strongest predictor of esophageal toxicity. Um, and uh, using a median split, um, to make a long story short, if we keep the biologically effective dose less than 21 gray, the risk of grade 2 or greater esophagitis uh, is only 1.3%. Uh, overall, again, our rate of grade 3 or, grade three or greater toxicity was extremely low. Um, so we actually fit this to some of the normal uh, tissue complication probability models that have been published and validated in fractionated radiation. Um, and two of the three uh, parameter sets fit quite well. Um, the implications of this is that we can use a, a decades worth, decades and decades worth of existing data to predict the toxicity as, as we move to higher doses in the mediastinum. So the plus signs are the existing data uh, for uh, fractionated radiation um, uh, as predicted by the CHIPET uh, parameters. And these large circles are our own data. As you can see, we fit the curve reasonably well as we accumulate experience. Hopefully, we'll gain more dose. But if we can use this model, basically, we can use our experience, which has relatively low toxicity, to predict where this curve is going to get steep. So again, uh, our rates of esophageal toxicity were, were quite low. Uh, we did identify parameters um, that do predict esophagitis. Um, and uh, we feel like, uh, if anything, we're being a little bit too conservative with these patients. OK, so you all survived that. Um, <laughs> Uh, the last is, is a pilot project that has uh, really been pushed forward by David Carlson, who's uh, one of my collaborators and one of our medical physicists. Um, and I think this is something that has uh, great translational potential. It's a project I'm very excited about. Um, this was presented by Olivia Collada, who's one of our postdocs. Um, and she's really put an incredible amount of work into this. And this was presented in our Best of Physics section. So um, tumor hypoxia is, is obviously quite prevalent. 
and um, in radiation oncology, we talk about two different kinds of hypoxia, diffusion weighted uh, or more transient perfusion limited hypoxia. The reason radiation oncologists care about hypoxic subvolumes is that uh, hypoxic tumors uh, have very poor outcomes. So uh, tissue hypoxia has been correlated with worse survival, a higher uh, degree of distant metastatic rate, and more importantly for me, a uh, significant radiation resistance. So it has been really well established that uh, hypoxic tumors are uh, less sensitive to radiation. And um, hypoxic sensitizers have been used uh, successfully in, for example, head and neck tumors and cervical tumors, um, although there are reasons why they have not been widespread in this country. So we set out to determine whether we could identify hypoxic subvolumes um, in our patients getting radiosurgery, which you can imagine is challenging considering how small they are. Um, it, it turns out there's, there's a, a great degree of um, controversy about whether hypoxia matters when you're giving 18 gray per fraction instead of 2 gray per fraction. Um, this is a, uh, a modeling study that uh, David Carlson published just showing that uh, our normal models of tissue hypoxia and radiation resistance demonstrate that, uh, in fact, at high dose per fraction and fewer fractions, um, resistance due to hypoxia is actually more important than it is for someone getting six or seven weeks of radiation. So uh, we initially did some mouse modeling studies, and this, these studies were conducted at the Yale Pet Center, and I want to thank uh, uh, Dr. Carson and all the other staff over there for their uh, collaboration. It's been fantastic. So, so um, mice um, with implanted tumors underwent uh, PET and CT scanning. Um, and in fact, we validated this by doing uh, Eppendorf probes um, and were able to correlate um, the uh, PET CT uh, images uh, with uh, tumor hypoxia. So this is not an FDG PET. This is a, a 18 fluoro uh, mysonidazole. So uh, F myso is a, uh, is taken up preferentially by hypoxic cells, so this is a well-accepted marker uh, for uh, hypoxic cell volumes that, that, again, has been used in patients in multiple institutions. So we were able to, to correlate and uh, from the rate of binding of the F-mysonidazole basically predict um, the tissue partial oxygen pressure. So the protocol that uh, we have opened and enrolled patients to includes three F mysonidazole PET CT scans. So the patients come in for a total of about 12 hours of scans, so three, four hour sessions. And what we've done is we've timed them before and after the first fraction of stereotactic body radiation. So they come in on a Monday and get their F mysonidazole PET scan. We treat them as soon as they're done. They come back on Wednesday and Friday and get two more scans. And then complete their treatment as they would normally. The reason we chose these time points is that typically we treat the patients on Wednesday and Friday. And in fact, many institutions would treat these patients Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, three days in a row. Um, so um, this is uh, one of our first patients enrolled, and to my knowledge is the first scan to demonstrate that there are hypoxic subvolumes in stage one lung cancer patients, which I think is quite exciting in and of itself. So um, you know, as you can see, the small tumor in the left upper lobe um, this is the baseline f mysonidazole PET scan. The fact that this is showing uptake in the area um, above background suggests that there are existing uh, hypoxic subvolumes within the tumor uh, de novo. After the first fraction of 18 gray, uh, 48 hours later, you can see that there's significantly increased hypoxia, and that's what you'd expect after a high dose of radiation. So again, this is normally when we would deliver the second fraction. So if you delivered a fraction to this tumor, you would fully expect it to not be as effective because of that hypoxic area. And again, by Friday, it seems to have normalized uh, back to baseline. Um, so uh, we have accrued four patients to this uh, study to date, um, funded by a variety of means, including, including um, Yale Cancer Center pilot funds. Um, and we are continuing to accumulate patients to it, and we hope that this will uh, represent uh, preliminary data. So this has, I think, uh, really interesting uh, translational implications. So if there is a, a, a sub-volume of hypoxic tumor within the tumor, there are several strategies which suggest themselves to how you might address this. Uh, one way is you might actually contour that area separately and deliver a higher dose of radiation preferentially to it, Okay, assuming that it's a stable geographic subvolume, uh, you could also uh, 
uh, deliver a hypoxic radio sensitizer. You could identify which tumors have significant hypoxia in them and deliver uh, a hypoxic radio sensitizer with your stereotactic radiation to overcome the resistance. Again, a strategy that's been used successfully in other tumor types. And of course, it has uh, dramatic implications for how we schedule our stereotactic body radiation. In Japan, for example, universally, they treat patients on consecutive days. Okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. This suggests that that's not a good idea. Um, and we have been treating patients on non-consecutive days, basically assuming that this has been going on. So I'm very excited to uh, continue to accumulate more patients to this. Um, we have some uh, circulating um, uh, microRNA uh, markers, which we're hoping will correlate with our um, f mysonidazole scans. Uh, we'll find us an easier measure for tumor hypoxia. Um, so again, acknowledgments and thank yous to all the people who worked so hard on this. The presentations um, at Astra were done by Eileen Harder, a medical student, Henry Park, one of our residents, uh, Olivia Collada, uh, um, our postdoc. Uh, thanks to all of our collaborator collaborators inside and outside the department, uh, as well as all the staff and faculty. And I'll just throw that. That's our closer to free team.